Okay, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everyone. So today, we're going to talk about miracles around the lake. So, Elisa, do you want to pray for us before yeah, we get abs started? Absolutely. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day, for bringing us all together. I ask for your Holy Spirit, Lord, please, to descend upon us and your presence to be in the room as we open up these words um, about Jesus and, and from Jesus. Lord, these are important stories, and they, they certainly still have a meaning for us today. So I pray that as we open your word, you will enlighten our hearts and minds and help us to apply these things, Lord, as you would, uh, our, your will is in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we know that Jesus spent quite a bit of time, actually, around uh, the Sea of Galilee. Our <clears throat> memory verse today is... However, Jesus did not permit him, but said, turn to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion for you. Isn't that all of our mission <clears throat> is to go and tell our friends <clears throat> and everyone what great things the Lord has done in our lives? <clears throat> so this is applicable not just to those around the Sea of Galilee, but also to us today. Letters and Manuscripts, volume 18, 1903, says the Sea of Galilee, Galilee was the scene of much of Christ's ministry. On the eastern side of the shore rises a great, to a great height. Surrounding, the surrounding country was a lonely region. There were desolate hills, and barren rocks where there were neither cultivated land nor homes. But to the place Jesus came, that he might be alone and commune with his heavenly Father. <clears throat> so Christ would go around to this desolate area where he could just have privacy. And I am sure that was there, it wasn't just about communing with his Father, but it was getting away from people to be able to commune with his father because people just did not leave him alone <clears throat> once they realized he had the ability to heal. So what do we know about the Sea of Galilee? Has anybody been to the Sea of Galilee? So a number of us here have been to the Sea of Galilee. Good. <clears throat> so the, the Sea of Galilee um, is actually a freshwater lake. It's not, a, it's not a salt sea. Um, however, the Dead Sea, which is not too far from the Sea of Galilee, is a salt sea. <clears throat> so we know that um, it's fresh water. It also went by some different names. It went by Lake Tiberias, Tiberias and Kinneret. And you'll actually see those names used in different places in the Old Testament. Um, when, when Joshua was talking about the areas yet to, to conquer, they talk about this area around the Dead Sea. And so <clears throat> the, it, it's approximately 13 miles or 21 kilometers long, 8 miles or 13 miles wide. It is the largest body of water in the area and was the center of life for the people of Palestine, of nearby Palestine. Its location is in a depression with mountains rising on both the east and the west that is conducive to storms descending quickly on the lake. <clears throat> and we see in the Bible there were times where storms would come up on the lake and we know that there, were time, there was at least one occasion where Christ quieted the storm. It sits at 686 feet below sea level. It's the largest, it's the lowest freshwater lake. The only, um, yeah, the, the only other is I think in Salt Lake in Utah, I think, is, the, is, is a, lower, a lower one. Um, it, it drains southward into the Jordan River, flows down the valley for 65 miles, emptying into the Dead Sea, which sits 1,400 feet below sea level 
and is the lowest point in the world. The, the Dead Sea, when I was there, was kind of a special place, I thought. It was quiet. It was away from, from a lot of crowds. We stayed in a little kibbutz there, right on the lake, which was, which was really nice. And you could go down to the lake and just sit there and imagine what Christ did while, while he was there. And, the, and as we went around the lake, we would see different areas of the lake where um, like the pigs went into the lake and, and um, different uh, Bible stories happened. So it was, it's really quite <clears throat> a pleasant place to visit. I think I liked it the best when I was there, really, that area. So today, in today's lesson, we're going to look. Um, Mark 4 ends with Jesus and his disciples traveling across the Sea of Galilee. A storm arises, Jesus calm, speaking to the waves. Then we get into Mark 6, it, it ends with similar scene. <clears throat> but this time, Jesus is walking on the water toward his disciples in the boat. In between the scenes on the water are numerous miracles of Jesus that were done in his disciples' first missionary activity. So we're going to get into the, that's going to be the subject of this week's story. The overarching characteristics of these dramatic stories is to let the reader see who Jesus is. He is one who is able to calm the storm, cast out demons, heal a woman who simply touches his clothes, raises the dead, preaches in his hometown, sends out his disciples on a preaching mission, feeds with loaves and fishes, walks on the water. So he does quite a bit here. Incredible displays of power are drawing the disciples closer and closer to an everlasting God. Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, <clears throat> Christ was to identify himself with the interests and needs of humanity. He who was one with God has linked himself with the children of men by ties that are never broken. Jesus is not ashamed to, be, to call them brethren. He is our sacrifice, our advocate, our brother, bearing our human form before the Father's throne. And through eternal ages, one with race, with the race, he has redeemed the Son of Man. And all this, that man might be uplifted from the ruin, thank you, and degradation of sin, that he might reflect the love of God and share the joy of holiness. Such love is without parallel. Children of the heavenly king, precious promise, theme of profound med mediation, the matchless love of God for a world that did not love him. The thought of s subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, the more we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice, and the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences of the love that is infinite. Amen. So, I, on that I, note, huh? I love everything that you said, all these things he does, and that's all in two and a quarter chapters. <laughs> I know. I know. It is. So, um, Byron, you are up for telling us about calming, calming a storm. storm. All right, calming a storm is one of those stories in the Bible that shows <laughs> the true nature and power of the incarnate Christ on earth. And the form of a man named Jesus. And we're going to read today Mark 4, th verses 35 through 41, um, here shortly. But verse 35, it says, on that day. So what happened on that day? Yes, yeah, I actually expect you to participate. <laughs> so what happened on that day? The sea. Well, before, <laughs> before he calms the sea. Well, and he was sleeping in the boat, but before they got into the boat. He was teaching. He was Terrible. teaching. There was a large crowd. The crowd was so big, he had to actually go in a boat to get away from them mobbing around him, right? Yep. So too many people. They told the parable of the sower and the soils and the s parable of the seed and the mustard seed, etc. So he's had an action-packed day, right, thus far. So he gets in the boat after that busy day, <laughs> and... Even before, remember when his family came to him and they're like, he's not eating, he's doing all this stuff. They thought he was losing his mind. 
So Jesus finally gets some downtime. He's in the boat and he crashes, to put it in modern terms, right? He's hard to sleep. Um, and he, he basically tells them, let's go to the other side. Let's, let's escape the throngs for a little bit, basically. So could somebody read Mark um, 35 through, or chapter 4, 35 through 41? Okay, that thank day, you. When evening came, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they, uh, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care what, uh, that we are perishing? And he got up and re rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Thank you. So we covered leaving the crowd, right? He had to escape. He had to basically have some some time with God and with his disciples and apostles right and I'm wondering they do not tell you in this but there's a small entourage of boats that are with them right I wonder what happened to them but they must have been hanging on for dear life as well and in verse 37 a fierce gale wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so if you've been to Israel and to um seen the museum you remember the museum where they found the boat like the first century fishing boat mm -hmm. so fishing boats back then were about 27 feet long by this one that they found in an archaeological dig in the sea of galilee about seven and a half feet wide at its widest point because it's kind of shaped like that and about um what was it four four point three <laughs> feet tall and so the draft on that, and if you don't know what draft means, the amount that the boat sits in the water, so it sits in the water about a foot and a half deep. But if you have that many people loaded in, I'm daring to imagine it goes a little lower. And they told us when we were in Israel, there are times, sometimes when the winds will come down from the areas around, like the colder air, and it will rush in and you'll get those storms, those kind of winds, the heavy winds and things like that. And so this was not necessarily uncommon, but what is uncommon and for those that have boats like today there's no self-bailing decks there's no drainage that goes overboard automatically they're starting to take on water and when you're in the boat and your feet are starting to sink in water it's a little <laughs> concerning so in verse 38 with that all that commotion what was the one thing that the disciples forgot they're fishermen right they know the sea they know boatmanship and things like that but who did they forget was there Jesus Jesus the same Jesus that and and he gets up well I'll get to it in a sec the same Jesus that that has been with them for so long right we're going to review what he's done in the previous chapters um but we look at this they're at the end of their rope they're we're going down we're done we're we're going to die thank you Lord for having us come right to this side but um, in verse 39 what does Jesus do he says hush be still and and the actual Greek that word hush is to be silent it's co paulo which basically it's to be silent or silent so he's telling the wind hush be silent and then um, the other part of it be still it's actually a phrase it's called "fimo" in Greek it means to muzzle so you literally forcefully muzzle somebody to make them quiet so they're unable to and I saw this and I almost thought like what, were there demons in the wind or something but no no we're, we're sticking with the um with the story here so what does God own but what has God made everything so what was made, who was everything made through? Jesus. Jesus. 
Everything was made through Jesus. And in Psalms 104, verses 1 through 9, I'm not going to go through all of this, all nine verses, but it talks about, basically, in verse 5, he established the earth upon its foundation so that it will not totter forever and ever. You covered it with, um, with the deep as a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains, and or at your rebuke they fled, and the sound of your thunder they hurried away. I want to actually add one verse to this. I think it's there. Um, you might have Genesis 1, verses 9 through 10. Can someone read that? Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Thank you, Brian. So who set the boundaries for the water lines? God. Who orders literally down to the point to where gravity is 9.8 meters per second, right? We know there are certain scientific rules in this world and that gravity is different on different planets and things like that. All of that is maintained and sustained by God himself. So for him to rebuke the wind, he owns the wind. <laughs> so even in his incarnate form on earth, he still owns all of these things, right? So, of course, when he rebukes the wind, it, it, it has to listen to him. And we know, I covered it earlier, but even in John 1, 1 through 3, it said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So, he commands the elements. They're all made through him. And in verse 40... Jesus rebukes the disciples for being afraid and having no faith. What do you think of that? I'm actually asking for input. Yes. <laughs> I could tell everybody had their breakfast of champions this morning. <laughs> so what do you think? That Jesus basically gives them a scolding, right? Why? Well, they had seen so many miracles already. They had. They had seen him heal many, many people and, and do all kinds of things. And yet, you know, it, with the power that they hadn't seen in centuries, right? Right. And so they should have, you know, at this point, they should have had some faith. So let me throw out a few things that have happened so far. He's cast out demons and healed ailments of every type, right? He healed a paralytic in chapter 2. Jesus forgives his sins and intentionally mm -hmm. does that so that they know he has the power of God to forgive sins. He's Lord of the Sabbath, right? When they're picking the, the heads of grain. He's commanding the elements might not be quite on that level, but who did they have with them? Jesus. Who do we have with us? Yes. Not only that, in their own culture, the rabbis and the master was one that they would reach out and for opinions and for everything, but yet they had not reached out for anything to him. So they didn't even treat him in that circumstance to the level of a rabbi. So what did they, who, what did they rely upon? Themselves. 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 Their past experience as fishermen. How are we any different? Do I, when I have a problem, do I go to God immediately? Or do I try and fix it myself? God, I got the little stuff. I'll call on you when I get something big, right? But right now I got this, okay? Now I'm the only one, right? I see at least some gears turning. It's very common for us to basically <clears throat> want to fill in for God. And how often do we do well? Terrible. We're horrible at it. <laughs> Our best good deed is a filthy <laughs> rag. So, um, and this isn't the first time, you know, I guess that they've, this is the first time they've seen him command the elements, but all these other things, if you have God in the boat with you, if he's in the car, even if you're driving, he'll still help steer you out of danger. If he's driving, you know you're completely safe. But so that's their lack of faith. 
And actually, I want to read Ellen White. You don't have this one, Brian, but I want to read Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 334 through 336. Absorbed in their efforts to save themselves, the disciples had forgotten that Jesus was on board. Now, seeing their labor vain and only death before them, they remembered at whose command they had set out to cross the sea. Yeah, it was Jesus' idea we're here, <laughs> right? But, and Jesus was their only hope. Suddenly, a flash of lightning pierces the darkness, and they see Jesus lying asleep, undisturbed by the torment. Why was he undisturbed? Why didn't the storm phase him? Who is he resting in? He's resting in the Father. And Thank he, you. And he's Lord of the elements. And right. so he knows that the Father can overcome anything. So he right. has no fear of that. Exactly. Well, and he's sure of his mission. Yeah. yeah. And his mission's yeah. not to, go, to die on that lake. And, right. and if the Father <laughs> has his back, do you think he has our back? Absolutely. So long as we're in his will. And there are times when we get in trouble, we need saving ourselves. But Absolutely. don't confuse that with condoning doing something we shouldn't be doing also. So um, as the lightning gl um, lightning's glare reveals him, they see the peace of heaven in his face. They read in his glance self-forgetful, tender love, and their hearts turning to him cry, Lord, save us, we perish. Never did a soul utter that cry unheeded. As the disciples grasp their oars to make a last effort, <coughs> Jesus rises stands in the midst of his disciples whilst the temp tempest rages. He lifts his hand, so often employed in deeds of mercy, and says to the angry sea, Peace, be still. As Jesus rested by faith in the Father's care, so we are to rest in the care of our Savior. So remember who has your back, but also remember you have to invite him in and have him as part of your life. Okay. Yeah. Elisa. Yes. Can you hear above a shout? <laughs> uh, yes. So this is in a very, very interesting story here. And <clears throat> we're going to read it from Mark 5. It's also found <clears throat> in Luke 9, excuse me, Luke 8 and, and Matthew 9. Um, the other accounts point out that there are two demoniacs. Mark points out one. Um, Ellen White also points out two. Um, but nevertheless, Mark focuses on this one. So let's go ahead and, and read about this. Um, so this incredible miracle um, is, is really around you know, healing and, and also um, release from bondage. And there's a lot of spiritual um, lessons here for us. So some key questions we're gonna talk about are, what was the condition of the demoniac when the person met Jesus? How did the demoniac respond to Jesus? How might the storm at sea the prior night be linked to this encounter? How did Jesus interact with the demoniac, who is a Gentile? How did the demons respond to Jesus? And what can we learn about the great controversy and the power of Jesus from this miraculous account? All right, so we're going to start by reading Mark 5, 1 to 20. Does want, someone want to be bold and, and read that through? I'll read. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a low, loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. 
and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him, who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. Okay, very good. Thank you, Danielle. All right, so what did we learn about the demoniac here? We don't know how he got there, but he was in an awful condition. That's for sure. He, he was, at this point, he was unable to help himself, right? He was completely at the mercy of the many demons that had... And also given away by the whole society. I mean, they, whatever, he was on his own. That's right. That's right. It says that they were living in the tombs, right. in the graveyard. That can't be very nice, right? Um, certainly no one in their right mind would be going, going in, and living in the graveyard. Um, and you're right, we don't know how he came to this, but we do know that it's a series of bad choices, right? And so, you know, whether he was involved in witchcraft or, I mean, they, he was a Gentile, right? And so he lived in a pagan nation. And um, this, this account of the story points out all the uncleanness there. The land was polluted. You know, gen the Gentiles being a pagan, you know, they, they were polluted, right? They were unclean. And so um, in his environment and his choices um, got him to that situation. Uh, he was tortured by demons, right? It's very interesting there um, when, when the demons implore Christ not to torment them by casting them into the abyss. What had be, they been doing to the man? Had they been not tormenting the man? <laughs> so isn't there some hypocr hypocrisy there? Like, don't torment us, we just want to torment something else. <laughs> the, the irony is they're tortured by not being able to torture. <laughs> yes, that, that's absolutely right. And, and that word abyss there, um, like, you know, there's there's a couple places in the, in the Bible where it points out this this term abyss that are are most prominent. One in Genesis, it was an abyss before God created the earth, and in Revelation 20, um, the devil will end up in the abyss again during those 1,000 years, um, and so. It's, it's a place where you cannot torment or anything is there, and they're just, they're just left to themselves. So um, that, that's absolutely right. Um, so we also know uh, from the story that no human help could, no humans could help him, right? They had tried to restrain this man many times through the, through the um, strength of the demons. He broke through the chains and the shackles and, and things, and he still carried those things on his body, but they no longer restrained him. So he had this unhuman strength. Do you think that promoted fear? Well, well yeah, and if I may address that, yeah. because maybe in this particular passage of scripture, that's one of the most important aspects of Christ's ministry, what he faced mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, he's a legion. What, what yep. is a legion? A legion is probably uh, a Roman unit consisting of about 6,000 men. Yes. So this was the most powerful uh, demonic, uh, demonic force that Jesus encountered. Yes. We, we're not talking about a simple, mm -hmm. uh, coincidental, um, you know, encounter with the devil. That's right. Th this, this was important. <clears throat> and so from my particular perspective, we are dealing with uh, a devil intent in destroying Christ and Christ's ministry. Never mind this individual That's right. who carried them all along, or the pigs who eventually suffered the, 
the you, you know the uh, the result of these demons. Yeah. No, you're 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 absolutely right. Um, but yet, in the dire situation of this man, there was a recognition that perhaps this was someone who could help him. That's exactly, and that's why he was there. And so there's some spark. Yeah. Some spark there left of hope, and so. It, the, the story in there tells us that he, he worships him. The, the word there says he bows down to him, but the, the translation is he worshiped, to worship Christ. But when he opened his mouth, what came out? Demonic rhetoric. It, it was, yeah. So he couldn't even speak for himself, right? Um, but yet, I, I can imagine that Christ perceived the, the, the begging in that man, right? And so... Um, and, and, and you mentioned how many, that there were many, um, and, um, you know, and they, and they don't want to just go out into the abyss. They want to torment something, so they ask for permission. They recognize Jesus as having power over them. <coughs> they could do nothing on their own, and so they <coughs> asked for permission to go into the pigs, right? And, and Christ allowed that, yeah. So um, just to give you a sense a little bit of the uncleanness there um, that comes from the, the Moses law. So the land where the man lived was ceremonially defiled. In Numbers 19, 11, and 16, we read, he who touches a dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. Whoever in the open field touches one who is slain by a sword or who has died or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. So these men living in the graveyard, you know, um, were unclean. And then um, also because they had active bleeding, that was unclean. You can read about that in, Revela in, in Leviticus 15. And then pigs are unclean, right? Uh, Leviticus 11, 7 says, And the swine, though it divides a hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cut is unclean for you. So there was uncleanness all over. The land, the economy based on, you know, the, the swine and um, these, these men who were defiled by demons. But Jesus was unafraid. So Jesus had knew, knew his mission, as Barb said, knew his father and knew why he was here. He had a divine appointment to be in the land of the Gentiles that day. So Jesus was unafraid. We don't know what, where, the, where the rest of the disciples went. Perhaps they like went back to the boat, scared of who this was. No, 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 um, no doubt people were afraid of these men. And Ellen White writes around how they cast fear into the people of the townspeople. But Jesus was also unaffected by the impurity of these men, right? Jesus could not be def defiled by them. So he had the power through the Father to cast them out and to purify these men. So Jesus was, um, you know, the, the only power that could do that. And um, so, he, so then the man at the end, he asks, what does he ask of Jesus once he's been released to bondage? He wants to stay with Jesus. And, and, and wouldn't any of us, having been in bondage like that, wouldn't we want to be with the person who had released us? Um, and, um, but what did Christ say to them? Stay. Stay. Yeah. Stay and do what? Tell what God's done. Be a witness. Right? Be a witness to those in, in your family and your town and who you are. And the, and the record of the, the gospel records that that's his, what he did. He went around all Decapolis and, and told of what the Lord did. What a powerful witness. Um, so um, so there's, a, there's a microcosm here of the great controversy, right? So the, the war between good and evil is played out in this story. Satan, through sin, brings people into a cruel bondage that they cannot escape from. But it's overruled by Christ. And we have that same power available to us today. Even though he's not physically standing in front of us, um, we have his, his spirit and, and his presence here with us. 
And um, we also learn that Satan doesn't give up without a fight, right? Mm -hmm. And so can we expect that's true today too? So if, if we're trying to overcome some stronghold of sin in our life, or we're trying to do something for the Lord, is it surprising when trouble comes our way? No. no. And, and, that, and that's the, kind of the point also around the, the, the storm on the sea the night before. Do you think that perhaps Satan knew that there was a mission to go over to and, and, and release these men of demons over on the other side in the Gentile land? And do you think perhaps a storm was strong enough that he could stir it up even stronger to create this fear and try to interrupt that mission? Perhaps. Like the Bible that. doesn't tell us, but perhaps. You're going where I did, but I still, it, it's a possibility. It is a possibility because Satan will try to interrupt the mission of God no matter what. The other thing we learn is that Jesus wins the battle. Yes, always. The demons are subject to his will, always. It is our choice, but he always wins the battle. And he liberates humans from sin, bondage, and restores them to the position God created them for, as he does for us today. People who are released from sin bondage are to become a witness for the Lord and bless others. And in doing that, we are more blessed. That is the power of the, the great controversy. Um, I don't have time to read for you the chapter 35 in Desire of Ages that, that Ellen White just really expounds on this. So I encourage you, if you didn't read it this week, go back and read it. It's a beautiful story. Okay, so should we go to Tuesday? Tuesday. So it's on the roller coaster with Jesus. So would somebody read for me Mark 5, 21 through 24? <clears throat> sure. I get on one. Now when Jesus had crossed over again <laughs> by boat to the other side. That's not, is that the one? Not the one. Oh. Okay. I must not have the right one up there. What was the numbers again? Mark 21. You know that no. little screen where it has technical difficulties and the film going everywhere on the projector room? That's not. That's not. <laughs> no, this is the right. Yeah, this, this is the right one. Yeah, Mark 21. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now when Jesus had crossed o over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. So I want to I want to make sure we understand who this Jairus is. Who is he? It's a ruler of the, the synagogue. And and what does that what did that mean? Political and religious power in the area. Yeah, he was he did he had political and religious power. The other thing that's interesting about Jarius is he wasn't the typical leader in the synagogue in the way he treated Jesus. And I, we're going to really quickly here go through a few. Uh, scriptures that show how most of the leaders of the synagogue treated Jesus. Let's look at Mark 1, 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Christ had a depth to him that the rest of them did not have. And so there was a little bit of jealousy there, right? And a little bit of, you're not one of us. You know how clicky people get. <laughs> oh, you're not really one of us. You're weird. You're, you're, you're a little different. And in Mark 3, 2, it says, So they watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, so that they might accuse him. So most of them were trying to figure out a way to, to show, show he was doing something wrong. They were trying to disprove uh, his, his ministry. And Mark 3, 6, then the Pharisees went out 
and immediately plotted with her, the Herodians against him that they might destroy him. So their goal was to get rid of him. He, he, was, he was a thorn in their side. You know, Barbara, and it makes sense. He was the word. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just reading it. He wasn't just speaking it. He was it. Yeah. And when you're in the midst of him being hit, he be, that hit becomes a huge challenge yeah. to your journey, to your conscience, and to who you are. And that's really the reaction. Christ is it. Yeah. And in the midst of my journey, I'm either with him or I'm not with him. Yeah. So, and, and then Luke 13, 14 says, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. And so we see that they were constantly attacks against Jesus. So it's very unusual that this man, Jarius, would come to him and s on bended knee, mm. literally, and begging. He fell at his feet. So he's literally on the ground begging Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Literally his desperation to save his daughter broke his pride. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It did. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Uh, Armand, you're doing a great job. You want to keep going here? Mark 25. A woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Yeah. So Christ and the whole crowd, and I'm sure the whole crowd is following him, is on their way to Jairus' house to heal his daughter, right? And all of a sudden, in this crowd, what happens? Somebody? You, have, you have a stealth healing. You have a stealth healing. Yes, you do. Somebody touched him. And what are the, how, how do the disciples react to this? <laughs> what do you mean somebody touched you? <laughs> you're in a crowd of people. The, of course you're going to get touched. The, seriously, Jesus? <laughs> I know. Seriously. <clears throat> you know, Barbara, th this is a great illustration of God's power. From this particular perspective, the reverse yeah. We were just talking about how these Pharisees reacted to Jesus. And, and here's the reversal. Yeah. How does Jesus sense our need in a crowd? How can Jesus really be responsive, be responsible or be response, responsive to my need in the midst of billions of people around? How yeah. can he be? See, this shows an incredible, uh, an incredible and genuine Christ who is so available right now for me and for my need. It's just incredible. Yeah. But let's, let's talk about, I want to take a minute to talk about this woman who touched Jesus. Because when she was in this crowd, she was, first of all, she was pretty timid, huh? It was like, oh, I don't want to interrupt him. I can see my mother doing that. Oh, I, I, I can't bother him. He's, he's far too busy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, he, he's on a mission. I, I, I can't interrupt him. But yet, what had her life been like? If she had, been, had, had this issue of blood for 12 years, what was her life like? Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's, not qu it's not quite leper status, but it's not far from it. Yeah. Right. So she had been ostracized by everyone. She probably wasn't even within the household. She was probably... In the shack out back. Yeah, yeah, in the shack out back. Plus, if you've been bleeding for 12 years, how miserable must you feel? She was anemic, weak, yeah. She just felt miserable. But what did she have when she saw Christ? Faith and hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. She knew he could heal her. She had faith that, that she could be healed. So what did she do? She just went up and just touched him. And Christ was react really reacted to it. it. It probably surprised him a little. Well, probably not surprised him, but... To everyone else, he, the way he reacted, who touched me? Because I mean, she just touched his clothes. Too. That's exactly. Right. Yeah. She Sharon, didn't even Sharon touch him. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You're dead on. Yeah. It was the clothes, and he felt it. Yeah. Yeah, which is amazing. Yeah, I'm sure he knew she was there. Yes. But the way it happened, it was kind of surprising to everyone around him, mm -hmm. and so. Um, and it's interesting, and I don't have time to get into it, but if you have a chance to read Ministry of Healing, mm. it, it, it's beautiful the way it talks about uh, how, what this woman had done and how sympathetic, how mm. much Christ loved her and just felt, uh, felt her pain. And so he wanted to make sure she was whole. And she was whole. So this is a good lesson for us in what way? Jesus is never too far away from me. Yeah. Well, He's approachable. It's a big comment on society as well. Yeah. And, and I like what Victor said about, you know, how how Jesus perceives our need and knows our need, even in a crowd. Mm -hmm. That just shows how personal and individual relationship-oriented God is. God is. He's not some God and doesn't know what you're doing. Like He is so in tune with Victor, yeah, with exactly. Danielle, with any of us. Exactly. And that is just amazing. Well, even the disciples would have been shunning her. Of course. Yeah. 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 And he wanted to inspire his disciples and those around that there was hope. I'm guessing the word for heal there, or whole, is a sozo in Greek. And it's not just physically being healed, it's spiritually and mentally being healed. So the whole being, body, mind, and spirit, mm -hmm. is actually what is healed. Mm -hmm. So Christ is not only healing her with that hope of her physical ailment, he's bringing her spiritually and mentally to a place she's been lacking. Yeah. And he does that with every one of us. I would like to be able to understand something. When Jesus said or told her, daughter, your faith has already healed you. What did yeah. he mean by that? Yeah. So, you want to take it? Oh, what did he mean by his yeah. faith? Mm -hmm. yes. Her faith had already healed her? Yes. Christ appreciated faith. Mm -hmm. He really did appreciate faith because so many around him had no faith. And he, this was a lesson he wanted to teach people. Faith can heal. Faith is the basis of my salvation. Unless I have faith in Jesus and what Jesus did for me at Calvary, there is no salvation. Yes, faith heals you physically exactly. and spiritually. spiritually. Well, and it was, it was her faith that prompted her to reach out and touch his clothing. Right. Yeah. In her mind, it was, if I, I mean, she, she had to deliberately go to that crowd because she knew he was coming, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. She would normally not be allowed in the crowd because they were shunning her. And so she, but in her mind, she goes, if I can just touch his garment, I will be healed. That was her faith. 
And she was blessed by that from the Father because the power went out through Christ and it healed her. And we're going to learn about that absence the of... Desire. The desire that she had in her. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to learn about the absence of faith and how that affects him in Nazareth. Yeah. So. And you you see in Desire of Ages how she just fell at his feet with appreciation. Scott and then It's also interesting show. that Jesus meets people where they are. Mm -hmm. So for her, she believed that if she could touch him, she would be healed. And so it was the centurion, he could believe that Jesus could also heal at a distance. And so he did remote control healing as well. And then for the blind man it says he actually made clay out of dirt and his spit and I was like that's kind of a unique way of healing the guy of blindness so Jesus did met people in different spots where they were yeah. and he healed in different ways showing that it was the faith component that was the common denominator not necessarily a specific manner okay I, I want us I want us to finish this lesson really quick so I'm cut up hang on here because I know that there's so much more but the story isn't over we still remember Jarius it started with him so we have to finish with him as well and so uh, let's read really quickly uh, this the, the the rest of the scripture here in Mark uh, 535 to 43 while he was still speaking some came from the ruler of the synagogues also who said your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? <clears throat> as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. When he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kume, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl rose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat. So both requests were honored, weren't they? The woman who touched his garment and, and Jarius. But just as, as we move on, I want you to just think about the roller coaster of emotions that Jarius must have gone through from sitting and pleading with Christ to hearing, now my daughter is dead not knowing that Christ could raise her from the dead, feeling like he'd lost his child, to going and seeing her alive again. That roller coaster of emotion probably took him days to recover from. Byron. All righty. So we're going to move to Wednesday, Rejection and Reception. <coughs> so since the title has rejection first, we're going to start there. Hmm. Um, would someone like to read Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6? Teaching at Nazareth. And here's where we're going to get into that aspect of no faith and how it affects healing. Anyone? Don't everyone jump in at once. <laughs> All right, Jesus. Let's, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Doc. Jesus okay. went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as uh, and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And as and he was going around the villages and teaching. Thank you, Scott. So we see, uh, we're, 
We're going to spend a lot of time on this because we have to pick either the rejection or reception. There's not time to do both. So I'm going to paraphrase the reception at the end. But with this, um, I'd actually like to read Luke 4.22. It's from the New King James Version. And this is after Jesus reads the verse from Isaiah 61. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Now you think the word marveled there is a good thing, right? Wow, that's amazing. But in the Greek, that word marble, marvel is thalmazo. And yes, I phonetically do these things out because how would I know? But um, to be astonished. But it can also, as they go into the exhaustive concordance, it can also be used in an attitude of criticism, doubt, or even censure or rejection. So you see this, isn't this Joseph's son? Do you think people had a hard time with Jesus they knew growing up as opposed to the Jesus that they hear about now? Oh, boy. So... Because they all, I think, had the idea that the Messiah would come from this royal line and that he was going to come and be announced with some pomp and then he was going to, uh, you know, lead the people of Israel to right. a glorious war to defeat the Romans and so on and so forth. So he, he was not meeting their expectations. Have you ever, uh, and this is maybe not the best analogy, but have you ever known somebody like you grew up with and they left wherever you grew up and, um, and et cetera, and then they came back and they're like, oh, you think you're something. I remember you when you were in diapers or something like that, right? Or when you were this punk kid and all that. Do you think there was maybe a little bit of that? How did he become this when I knew him as this? Joseph claimed to be dad, and Mary claimed to be mom. Right. Joseph and dad were just like human beings. Well, and Joseph Why would he be any different? claimed to be, right. But even right. later, they right. actually questioned his parentage, right. at least on his father's side. Right. Well, it um, hadn't gotten around how he had been in the synagogue teaching when he was a young right. child, either. Right. Well, and then I want to actually read something from um, Luke, um, chapter 4, verse 25 through 27. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. And he's saying this to them at the synagogue, right? When the sky was shut for three years and six months, when the great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, Zarephath and the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. So how do you think they responded to that? Basically, he's saying God has a place for these people as well. And basically, the Jews, you're not quite coming up to the mark that God expects. And... I'm just going to go ahead and read from Desire of Ages with Ellen White. The words of Jesus to his hearers in the synagogue at Nazareth struck at the root of their self-righteousness, pressing home upon them the bitter truth that they had departed from God and forfeited their claim to be his people. I'm just going to stop there for a moment and go, ouch, right? So... Every word cut like a knife as their real condition was set before them. Now they scorned the faith with which Jesus had at first inspired them. They would not admit that he who had sprung from poverty and lowliness was other than a common man. Their unbelief bred malice. Satan controlled them. All Satan needs is that sin, that doorway to get in. And we open lots of them, don't we, at times? And Satan controlled them. And in wrath, they cried out against the Savior. They had turned from him whose mission it was to heal and restore. Now they manifested the attributes of the destroyer. So how bad was this encounter, this faithless encounter with a Jesus that they could only see as the one that they knew from childhood, etc., and they were controlled by Satan. 
This is the ultimate, Luke 4, 28 through 29. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. And if you've been to Israel, they take you to that cliff. Mm -hmm. And I've looked down, I've leaned over, because I don't really like heights, but I've leaned over and taken the picture. Yeah, it's going to leave more than a mark if you fall down there. And so they literally wanted nothing to do with him or, in that matter of speaking, God. So the self-righteousness of those in Nazareth blinded them to the true nature of Jesus, really to the true nature of God. But also... It can affect others in their world. Remember when their, his mother and his brothers were calling him because they thought he lost his mind? Mm -hmm. Do you think word got back about that? Oh, that Jesus, he's something. He won't even, he disowned his mother and brother and says the people around him are family? Try that in a Jewish, in a Jewish culture. You, you're not going to be very good, right? The jealous, there could be the jealousy from the miracles in Capernaum but neglected his hometown, and really just the lack of faith. Almost every miracle in the Bible has some element of faith in it. If it's not the person themselves, it's the person that brings the people, like the guy that's lowered through the roof, right? His friends had great faith. So you see that element of faith in almost every healing. I think there's maybe a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, it's almost a requirement. Um, and so disbelief seems to negate that healing power. It's almost kind of like grieving the Holy Spirit. If you're that negative, like God's like, if you really want nothing to do with me, I will give you your wish, and that includes not healing. Because it takes the Holy Spirit to do that. Uh, faith is how we start a relationship with God and this is how their faith or disbelief is how a very good way to end it. So, can these things affect us today? Oh, yes. So, let's go to the sandwich part of this, of this um, to the second part. And we're going to actually look at the reception. So, let's go with that. We have a top slice of bread, a bottom slice of bread, and the meat in between, right? A sandwich. So, I'm going to go quickly here. Um, we see the 12 cent out. And Mark 6, 7 through 13. So he summons the 12 and sends them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Jesus had instructed them that they should take nothing in their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. Only bring one change of clothes even. Oof, boy, I don't know. That's kind of warm there. But anyway. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. And they went out and preached that men should repent. So I want to focus on rep uh, a message of repentance, right? And that they're casting out many demons and anointing with oil. Um, <clears throat> so that's the top part of the sandwich. What did God tell them to rely on? God. <laughs> And, and Byron, that, 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 I'm so glad that, that in this particular lesson we have that. Right. Because the reality is this. The problem, as we explained before, is that uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jews, they were so assured of their own righteousness oh, yeah. that Christ's righteousness was no longer a matter of consideration. What Jesus does to the disciples is just that. You go with me. What you have isn't good enough. What right. you believe isn't good enough. Who do you think you are isn't good enough. You go with me and you will be righteous. That's the message for me, for you, and for everybody else. And this is really what it's all about. Jesus here is really saying to the Pharisees, you really think you've got it. You really think you've already entered the kingdom of heaven. I've got news for you. You're so far out that your righteousness is filthy rags. Right. So that's the top part of the sandwich, right? The bottom part of the sandwich is 
One verse, Mark 6.30. The apostles gathered, gathered together with Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Pretty good, pretty simple bottom level, right? In between, um, and I'm just going to paraphrase a lot of this. So we have John the Baptist. He's in prison, right? He, um, and then we have Herod and his wife, um, Her um, Herodotus, and which was his wife's, or his brother's wife. They have Salome dance for him so seductively. Mind you, this is his niece, his brother's child, dance so seductively for him that he's willing to give her half of his kingdom up to. This makes Jerry Springer look good. <laughs> so, but, and then, um, so she asked her mom, and her mom hated John the Baptist for condemning their relationship so bad, give me his head, right? What message did John preach? A message of re yeah. repentance. What did, the God, what did the apostles go out to preach? That, uh, they went out and preached that men should repent. Does God need us to fulfill his mission? It is a privilege for us to be used by God to fulfill his mission. If he wants something done, it's going to happen, no matter what you or I think, no matter what we do. Right? Even remember when Mordecai says to Esther, how do you know God didn't put you in this position to save the Jews? But if you don't do it, God has another way to do it. This is your choice. But so we see one ministry in with the beheading of John the Baptist, but we see a new ministry, an even better ministry that starts with the repentance, but then moves to the repentance and the Holy Spirit begin. And that is the sandwich. And on that note, I am so out of time, I'm going to move to Elisa. Okay, all right. So we're going to talk about a different kind of Messiah. Um, Scott gave uh, you know, a really good account of the prevailing attitude of the time was that the Messiah was going to come as a po political and religious leaders and free them from the Romans and you know, reestablish Israel as the, a prominent nation on earth. Um, but from the accounts that we're going to read about Jesus feeding the multitude and calming the sea here in Mark 6, how is Jesus really different than the prevailing attitude? He's a different kind of Messiah than they were expecting. So we're going to ask that question as we go through it. Let's start by reading the first part, which is verses 34 to 44. And if I could have a reader, please. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Okay, thank you. So Jesus and the disciples had been grieving the loss of John the Baptist, right? And so Christ had said, come away with us, come away, you know, to a quiet place. They needed that, you know, just resetting and that, that time with the Lord to just, you know, um, grieve, you know, this situation and, and, you know, really just, you know, have that quiet time. But the multitude seeing Jesus and, and the disciples depart followed them so that when they arrived at the shore, there was this great multitude meeting them. So the people recognized that Jesus had 
a power that was different from their religious leaders. Um, not only did, uh, does the Bible tell us that he spoke with authority that was different than the leaders, but you know, he did all these miracles and um, he just you know, had, had a, different, a different power that they recognized. So in Mark 6, 2, it says that, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this that which has been given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So they recognized that there was someone special amongst them, right? And with the expectation that the Messiah was coming, they were like, is this perhaps him, right? And is, are we finally going to be delivered? So what was Jesus' response to the multitude when he saw them? Again, he's tired. He had a long day of teaching. They heard this terrible news. They're grieving. How would you respond? I had enough. I want to go home. Yeah, <laughs> probably. So Jesus, it says, he had compassion on them. And he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Is Christ not the shepherd that came to save the lost sheep? So he... His ministry and his mission prevailed over his own physical and mental and spiritual need he had at the moment. Um, and so that, that shepherd without a sheep is the same phraseology used in Old Testament. I'll give you one example. Numbers 27, 16 to 17 said, Moses, asking the Lord to give Israel a leader to replace him, said, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead the out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. You, you know what he said? Jesus was teaching his disciples probably one of the most incredible, incredible subjects on evangelism. Mm. Evangelism is not only about the soul. Evangelism must be also about the social environment. Mm -hmm. By providing food, bread, and food, he brought them in to his own. Yes. That's evangelism. You teach the word and you bring the people together. Yeah. And in, in an environment of, of fellowship, yeah. you open up the heart. That is essential. This was a very important function of Jesus. Yeah. And he taught the disciples a great deal. If you are going to just stand on a soapbox and read the Bible, yeah. you are not fulfilling it. That's right. That's right. Bottom line. And, and, and it, I, I like what you're saying about evangelism. I mean, it requires sacrifice. Yes. Did the Lord not sacrifice what his physical and mental perhaps and spiritual needs were at the moment because he saw these people who had a greater need and his mission was more important than his own need and that's really what we're all called to do right in in being the witness um but what was the problem that jesus and the disciples encountered after teaching the multitude for probably hours it was like Hunger. Hunger. Late in the day and there was no food. What I, what I find like really interesting is that the, the, the Bible records that there were about 5,000 men. Well, that means there's probably about 15 to 20,000 people there, right? Because there were women and children and whatever. So it's not just 5,000. It's like a really big multitude. So only two loaves and five fishes or two fish and five, whatever it is. Five loaves, right? two, five loaves two fishes. Thank you. Um, Amongst all those people, like, why were the people not prepared? Like, seriously. But nevertheless, that was the situation. So the disciples, though, how did they respond to this need? Send them away. <laughs> like, there's nothing we can do. That's not my problem. It's not my problem. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So they were looking at it from very human terms. And, and again, you know, Byron kind of went through all the different things we've re read in the book of Mark so far that Jesus did and all these, you know, miracles and casting out demons and teaching people and all these things, forgiving sins, and yet they still did not perceive that the one that was with them could do something about this need. They're a little dull. 
<laughs> well, let's not be so harsh on them. Oh. Um, but yes, they were. Um, so Jesus, again, he has faith in the Father. Mm-hmm. He prays and over and blesses the food. He he asks them to go get what was av- available. He bl- he blesses it and it just multiplies, right? Well, all these people had no way to wash up before they ate either, and that was a big deal. Well, it it, it, it was society. in the Jewish economy for sure. Yeah. Well, that wasn't that uncommon. You could hear yeah. a wash. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um. But what was interesting is that the, the account records that there were 12 baskets left over. So there's a spiritual significance there. Mm-hmm. Who is the bread of heaven? Christ is. Jesus. Christ is. John 6, 32 and 33 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread of heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Amen. So... Christ is the bread of heaven that feeds the world. There's 12 baskets left. There were 12 apostles. And those 12 apostles, through their work in that first century, have they not fed the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there is a spiritual significance to that. Um, What what do we learn about the multitude in, in this account? We talked about the number. It was probably much greater than the 5,000. Nobody brought one more application of what you're mm-hmm. saying. So after the bread was taken away, there were 12 baskets. So after Jesus was taken away, there were 12 disciples left. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Okay, so um, we had talked about nobody brought their own provisions. So they came empty. They came empty handed. They were sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. Christ fed them by a miracle. He fed them physically, he fed them spiritually, he filled them up. Right. They left full. They, he said they came as they were. Exactly. You and I have nothing to offer God. That's right. Nothing. That's right. And so we come empty and Yeah. We can only be filled through the Holy Spirit when we accept God's offer. That's right. That's the bottom line. That, that is the bottom line. Um, okay. So we are like really, really short on time today. We're not going to go through um, Jesus walks on the sea. I'll, I'll have you do that. I am going to um, I'm going to quickly just point one thing out because in that last part of the account of Jesus walking on the sea, the last verse says that their because their hearts were hard, they did not perceive. Um, what um, what Jesus had done. And Ellen White writes about that a little bit. She says, the disciples had not put off immediately from the land as Jesus had directed them. They waited for a time, hoping that he would come to them. But as they saw the darkness was fast gathering, they entered into a ship and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And they left Jesus with dissatisfied hearts. They were more impatient with him than ever before since acknowledging him as their Lord. Did they want him to to stand up and say, I'm king and I'm now going to deliver you? That's what was in their heart, as was a prevailing attitude. So they are so dissatisfied with him because they had 5,000 men. Could that not create some sort of political unrest? Yes, but what did Jesus do? He had dismissed them. So they murmured because they had not been permitted to proclaim him king. They blamed themselves for yielding so readily to his command. They reasoned that if they had been more persistent, they may have accomplished their purpose. I'll let you read the rest of that in chapter 40 in Desire of Ages. But is that not, is it not so much like <coughs> us sometimes? We harden our heart because of our own perceptions and of what we want. The Holy Spirit, the, the account there in Mark says, that they missed the blessing of what had been done in feeding the multitude because their hearts were hard. That's a powerful lesson for us today. I will pass it to Barb for closing thoughts. I'll just say, uh, you pointed out, a lot of times we put God in a box. Lord, do what I want you to do. Yeah. And I don't really care about your agenda. I want you to care about my agenda. Yeah. And God just shakes his head like, when are they going to learn? Yeah. Yeah. 
making that stated as a in sort of a military type thing. Yeah. Because they weren't as concerned about how many souls were being saved. Because it doesn't say 20,000 souls. It says, so they were thinking, how can we create an army? So uh, 5,000 was a pretty good number. I mean, Gideon had defeated the Midianites with 300. Yeah. And I think David, at the time when he was fleeing Saul, only had 600 men with him. Yeah. So um, he was like, well, 5,000, we're doing pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Before we wrap up, I want to welcome our guests today. We have <laughs> gentlemen and lady. We have uh, some uh, guests here from the Philippines. Some Indonesia. Indonesia, I'm sorry, Indonesia, and <clears throat> they, you're pastors, right? Yeah. And they are here with, uh, to go with the Pathfinders uh, to the Camporee, and then our, our lady friend here behind Scott is from Kenya, right? Yes. yes, and she was here last year, and she too is going to be going to the Camporee with the kids. Nice. So welcome, we're glad you're here. We want to pray with you and over you after church today, so we're looking forward to that. But in finishing, I want us to think about these parables that we've seen and read and talked about today. And like Elisa was talking about with this 5,000, they were so focused on their belief that Christ was coming that the Christ, when he came, was going to save them from their earthly situation, that they lost sight of the big picture. And sometimes in our own lives, on a day to, uh, in our daily battles and our daily fights, we too lose track of the big picture. We're worried about what's going on in our little church. We're worried about what's going on in the global church. We're worried about this person or that, or that issue or whatever. And we're really missing, is what I'm doing today going to make a difference for eternity? And so we too can get caught up in that trap. And so let's, let's, not, let's not do that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for what you have taught us today. Father, we look forward to your return again, that we can be in your presence, that we can see you face to face, that we can sit and learn um, even more truth than you have given us, Lord. You have opened up your word for us today, and we know that your spirit was with us. So, Lord, we, we pray that as we go on to church, that you will truly bless. It's going to be Children's Day today, Ministry Day. Um, we have a beautiful sermon prepared, and we want to do a wonderful send-off for our kids who are going to Camp Aree and those who have come so far to travel with them. So, Lord, we thank you for blessing and what a beautiful Sabbath you've given us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Offering plate. Offering. Offering. Oh, offering? Yep. Light is by the door. All right. Oh, yeah.